Hi there, my name is Dan Garrick and I'm going to talk to you today about Badger and how we're using it for some genomics applications and specifically some software tools we've developed uh, which use Badger as a data store underneath. And I wear three hats, uh, if you like. Uh, one of those hats is that I'm the managing partner of Theta Solutions, which is a, a US-based company involved in uh, statistical modeling, primarily for animal and plant genetic and genomic evaluations. I'm also the founder of The Helical Company, based in Whakatane, New Zealand, and uh, is a sister company of sorts to Theta, supporting our operations. And I'm also an adjunct lecturer uh, at Massey University. So just to introduce myself a little bit, my background, uh, I, I grew up on a, a small uh, farm in a, a little town, rural town in New Zealand called Colleton. And uh, be just before I turned 13, my family moved to the US uh, and my dad was a professor uh, got, and got a job over there. So I went through high school and then subsequently university in the States and I got a bachelor's and PhD in aerospace engineering at Iowa State where I worked on uh, the computational fluid dynamics of rotors and wind energy and multi-phase flow modeling. And um, there's a, a, a some of that involved what we call helicopter brownout simulations, where helicopters land in the desert and simulating uh, how how the dust clouds form. I spent some time at Boeing in Philadelphia working on the V22 Osprey, and then my my PhD research was on developing methods to simulate fuel sprays and supersonic flows. And uh, about the time I was finishing my PhD. I had an opportunity to join a new company uh, that was working in the genetics and genomics field. And uh, surprisingly enough, the equations that are, that are being solved for genetics and genomics modeling are, are, are similar and use similar methods, similar linear methods uh, to solve those equations as what we use to solve uh, fluid flow equations. So there was quite a lot more crossover between aerospace and genetics than you might think, uh, but that's how I got my start. And just to introduce a little bit, uh, a little bit of background here, genetics is the, the study of inheritance of traits. And uh, what that means is, is really we're talking about looking at your family tree, uh, which we call the pedigree. So your parents and the traits they have and how that's passed down onto the offspring. And genomics is, is in some sense an extension or, or related to that uh, where we're studying specifically all of the DNA and the DNA components and contributions to that. Um, and when you're talking about traits, that could be performance traits, things like growth, uh, and it could also be health traits uh, or survival traits, uh, disease resistance, those kinds of things. And this has applications both for humans, uh, obviously consumer companies like 23andMe.com and, and Ancestry are, are um, you know, taking advantage of, of this science to market to consumers. Uh, there's also personalized and precision medicine applications and uh, pharmacogenomics pharmacogenomics applications and uh, our, our industry uh, specifically we, we focus on the niche that is uh, plant and animal evaluations which is all about selective breeding of plant and animal populations uh, specifically to provide more efficient food and timber production and uh, but these these concepts can also be useful for managed conservation of endangered species where uh, sort of genes need to be carefully managed when you have a small breeding pool so that uh, uh, you know genetic diseases uh, don't don't take over so just to give an idea of where um, this where badger fits in I suppose uh, there's there's a, a, a schematic here of a information pipeline if you will uh, which is is common in the world of animal and plant genetics and effectively you start with a business objective and that can vary depending on the industry you're in um, but 
it, it's always would start with some kind of value proposition, which is typically going to be something like profit, but it doesn't have to be. And to uh, you know work towards increasing that value, you'll have some kind of data that's going to feed into an inf uh, 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 information system. And uh, you know, going back to the previous slide, in our case, that's going to be talking about pedigree, recording those family relationships. It's going to be about the traits, those growth traits or health traits, as an example. And it's also bringing in that DNA and uh, genotype information. And you can probably see the little badger icon I've got there. Uh, so that's that's specifically what I'm going to be talking a bit more about uh, today because we have effectively built a, a genotype information system uh, with Badger underneath. And just to provide some context about our uh, company Theta Solutions, we develop software tools, GPU accelerated software tools for the types of linear modeling that involves taking in this pedigree trait and genotype data and evaluating it so that you can get a merit ranking of animals uh, to feed back into your decision support systems to decide uh, which which animals you should use to breed the the next uh, better generation. So digging in a bit more into that genotype part of it, what does the genotype information pipeline look like? And the, the general concept is that you'll have some tissue samples that you will be collecting, you, in typically from, from farms. And uh, these farms might be sending those samples to one lab, or they might be sending them to different genotyping labs. Uh, but in any case, that lab will extract the DNA using a, a variety of different techniques, depending on the lab. Uh, and they will produce some kind of file with DNA content in it, which they will make accessible, uh, typically via something like an FTP server. Uh, so we might have multiple FTP servers uh, where different labs are, are placing these uh, information with the DNA in it. And we have built a platform which can then uh, check those FTP servers and download that information as it as it appears, stores it in a database uh, built on top of Badger. Um, we've built a web UI around that, a, a command line interface, uh, and it's got a number of analytical tools built in around uh, quality assurance and quality controls of those genotype samples so we can verify that the samples do belong to the individuals that we think they belong to, and that involves things like parentage checking, uh, which I'll get into a bit more soon, but also things like genomic gender estimation, uh, which basically means looking at the sample to figure out what gender that sample came from, and then also duplicate resolution. Uh, so if you have one individual who's been sampled multiple times, uh, for various reasons, you want to be able to see which of those samples is correct and whether the samples are uh, matching or not. And we have a host of other other uh, concepts and, and analytical uh, tools that we're adding to that all the time, which we will be um, announcing it in the future. But as a starting point, that's that's the rough idea of the information pipeline and, and data is, is, is being managed and queried out of that by various users and organizations. And we also need to be able to export data out of that for external analysis pipelines. So you might be thinking, uh, you know, this is DGRAPH day, why are we talking about Badger and not DGRAPH? But uh, Badger is the database that uh, DGRAPH is using underneath. Uh, and so I was fortunate to be invited to, to give this talk. I guess it was interesting enough uh, to, to talk here about it. And for our particular use case, we, we decided to go with Badger because it's got no dependencies, it's trivial to deploy, and we want to um, be able to provide our tools uh, to some of our clients to use as a, as a command line tool, and it means that we don't need to worry about um, having them set up other services at the same time. They can just have this command line tool to, to do what they need to do. And in particular, also the, the batch data import or the write batch API and the stream API are both really useful in Badger for our use case. 
and then the key only iteration uh, provides a lot of a lot of really powerful uh, features for us to query things out of the database uh, very quickly, which has allowed us to build this uh, a web interface on top of the uh, database that we're that we're using to store the genomic data. Uh, and it also means that we can we we try to all the tools we develop we we try to stick with a, a Unix philosophy where we have minimalist and, and modular software so we have uh, you know specific tools that do one thing and they do that one thing well more or less uh, and the idea then is that you can mix and match any any of these tools with other tools you may have to fit them into uh, newer existing pipelines. Uh, uh, and, and include them with other tools you might have for manipulating and analyzing data. And and the final reason is is we have a, a custom, highly efficient encoding of of genotype data, uh, which which means that we can store a large quantity of raw genotype data from raw files into a very small instance of of BadgerDB. And uh, DGRAF returns, uh, I think, only RDF and JSON, as far as I'm aware, uh, through the through the Go client. And uh, we just wanted to be able to build some other uh, analytical packages, which which make use of this encoding a bit a bit closer to the hardware, I suppose, if you will. So effectively, we've we've built a, a, a command line interface we called Helical for manipulating, managing, and analyzing genotype data. It's species agnostic. It's been applied to cows, sheep, horses, dogs, and trees so far. It includes a web UI with user authentication for data management and analysis. And uh, we can resolve multiple IDs per sample, multiple samples per individual, and hugely varying genotype chips. Uh, and I'll talk in a, next about what, what that means. Um, but uh, we're able to import automatically uh, and detect a, a, a range of different genotype file types. Uh, so we can import that data into Badger, uh, which we're using as the underlying data store for all of this. So what I mean by varying genotype chips, just to give an understanding of, of uh, perhaps more why we chose Badger, um, genotype data can be of varying densities and varying overlap. And what I mean by that is, is um, if you have what we call whole genome sequence, that, that encompasses the entire uh, genome, all of the DNA of, of a particular individual. And uh, it's very expensive to, at the moment, to capture the whole genome of an individual. And so what happens is once we know the particular regions of the genome that are important to us for one reason or another, uh, those have been uh, effectively put on on what we'll call genotype chips so that those chips will just in particular look at those particular locations of the genome and, and nowhere else and get that data out for us. Uh, but of course what happens over time is we discover that some of those pieces we were looking at are not as important as we thought and some other pieces might be more important and so over time the location and the data that's coming out of those chips is changing and also you know, just the changes in the technology means that uh, there might be increased amount of, of data in, in newer chips than there was in older chips. And, and so the uh, data that's coming out of these can vary over time and, and this makes it perhaps more difficult to fit this kind of data into traditional SQL tables where uh, you know, with these, with these, with these data varying over time, you're going to uh, have to fit them into lots of different tables and deal with all of that. And so, it's a, a nice use case for things like uh, Badger or or even DGRAF. Uh, another challenge is that you might ha have um, two different chips potentially coming from different labs who might use different chemistry to get that DNA information and they might be pulling information out from the same part of the genome but the names, the naming conventions they use for that inf information might be different and so you need to be able to resolve that in an easy way. So really what we've what we've built on, on Badger is, is more of a data warehouse where we're storing uh, effectively the the samples against their raw manifest from these chips and so what I mean by what I mean by that is that 
we might have samples coming through on what I've called chip one, um, which would have say 50,000 SNPs on it. Uh, and when I say a, a SNP, I'm, I'm talking about effectively a, a particular part of a genome, which has got variation across the population. And so those are the parts that we're interested in because it indicates um, uh, you know, things that might be different between one individual and another for us to measure. So, um, so one set of data might have 50,000 of these SNPs on it, and then another set of data we're getting from somewhere else might have 100,000 of those SNPs. Uh, and some of those SNPs may overlap uh, to some degree. So SNP1b might be the same as SNP1a here, but SNP1a here uh, and, and some other data might be the same as SNP2b. So uh, we need to be able to resolve those kinds of connections between the data uh, in an easy manner. And associated with each of these chips, we have what we call a map, which means uh, for each one of these SNPs, we have an identifier which is the name of the SNP, the chromosome that SNP sits on, and the position within the chromosome. And uh, these numbers are, are made up for, for illustration, but the, uh, that is the, the general concept. And taking that a, a step further, you can perhaps quickly see how we can build up these relationships where we are storing what we call a chip entity in the database, which corresponds with the particular maps for each of these types of chips we are storing. And then on each of these chips, we might be receiving multiple batches of samples. And so we are storing up those batches of samples and we're storing the relationship between all of those samples and the associated chip and we can do that for any number of chips and, and samples and um, we've built a lot of functionality to be able to easily export that data out to a particular subset of those samples and SNPs that we may so choose. And taking it a step further we actually also have uh, individuals that all of these samples are pointing to. So one individual, one animal, uh, might have multiple samples associated with it. And so that's another uh, connection or relationship, if you will, between the data that we're keeping track of. And then uh, in the case of looking at parentage and you're looking at uh, comparisons between samples, we need to be able to quickly query that information out of the database and, and badges is, uh, turned out to be very good for all of those kinds of use cases. So just as an example of some, some benchmarks, some, some real world uh, data, I'm always a fan of, of using real world data in, in these kinds of benchmarks and, and um, in this case I've <coughs> illustrated the particular <coughs> excuse me, particular command that we use to export data out of our database, uh, uh, which is the DB here. And we've just provided a list of SNPs that we want to extract, and those are being placed in a gzipped file. And I've run this on my six core uh, MacBook Pro and exporting 89,000 SNPs out of a database of 170,000 well, roughly 171,000 samples, which is stored across 58 of those chips I described, which range in size from 20,000 SNPs to 777,000 SNPs. And including the computation time it takes to resolve duplicated samples, which means if we have samples which are similar, we merge them, and if they're dissimilar, we uh, exclude them and we have some other QC steps that samples go through before they're allowed to be exported for use in an analysis. After all those steps we get 148,000 samples finally exported which amounts to about 13.3 billion SNPs and exporting that to a gzipped file comes out to about 3.7 gigabytes and it takes a minute and 41 seconds and exporting that to a 26 gigabyte text file takes uh, one minute and 21 seconds, which is, is roughly between, well, between those two, it's between 130 to 160 million snips a second uh, uh, and on, on a, a SSD hard drive. So pretty, pretty unbelievable um, performance numbers. I, I wouldn't say we've done a huge amount of optimization around those uh, exports, but we have done a little bit, uh, but I'm sure we can circle back around and get more out if we needed to.
and uh, so so we're able to to do these bulk exports really quickly, which is is really powerful for us. It means if um, we want a, a different export, we can easily just delete that old file and generate a new export, and it's resolving uh, all of that information out out across all of those chips and batches of samples we're storing across all those disparate pieces of uh, uh, information. And it means we're also able to build a, a web UI around it. And this is just an example image from our web UI where we're looking at a number of different samples and we're able to query on the fly uh, information about those samples and extract out the particular SNPs we might be interested in that we use to predict uh, the sex based on the X chromosome and Y chromosome, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, and and display those kinds of information and it's and it's uh, extremely fast, which is great. So this this thing can be real time, and. You know this is important because because managing this the the genotype data is is what takes a lot of time. So, in terms of QA QC uh, of these samples, one one good check is is we want to check if if an if a DNA sample is supposed to belong to a female individual, we can we can inspect that DNA sample and uh, come up with a prediction based on the X chromosome data and the Y chromosome data, whether that sample belongs to a male or female, and we can check that against the record we have for that individual to see if that matches up or not, uh, which is all a part of QAQC. And then another routine uh, check we're doing is something called parentage, um, which is based on the concept of uh, when you have your uh, uh, your sire or your father and a dam, your mother, an offspring inherits roughly 50% of their DNA from their father and 50% from their mother. And what that means when we go back to those tables with the SNPs in it is if we have SNP1 represented by AA for the sire, and we have SNP1 represented by BB for the dam, we know that that offspring should be AB uh, at that position because it's going, it has to inherit an A from its father and it has to inherit a B from its mother at that particular position. And uh, that's an, an AB is, is referred to as a heterozygote. Uh, while AA and BB are referred to homozygotes. And when we're verifying parentage, um, what that means is when we're looking at uh, one particular offspring, usually we know what the offspring DNA sample is and what the dam DNA sample is, so we'd be kind of working backwards from here. But to illustrate the point, um, we can go the other way. So in the case of a sire being AB and a dam being BB, we actually can't say for certain whether this offspring should be BB or whether it should be AB because it could inherit either an A or a B from its father and either uh, and, and only a B from its mother. Um, so it could be either AB or BB. So in that particular case, that SNP is not useful information for us for parentage. Uh, and in SNP3, both the sire and the dam are BB, so that means we know the offspring must be BB in that location. So that's those are the kinds of queries we need to do across that data we are storing. And... Uh, each of those samples for those three animals might be coming from different chips and the SNP naming might be different and we need to be able to quickly resolve all of that stuff uh, to compute this kind of thing. And another, another very useful uh, analysis that we're doing regularly is something called parent discovery. So for various reasons for animals you may not always know who the mother and father are. Um, uh, when, a, when an animal uh, gives birth to its offspring out in the field um, it's by the time the farmer goes out and, and discovers that uh, animal that's been born they may not have been around to see it actually happen and so you can't always guarantee um, which which mother it came from usually you can but uh, sometimes you can't and and obviously the sire is much more difficult uh, and in certain in certain situations and what that means is if, if we come across a situation where we don't know who the parents are for an offspring, we can search against the DNA samples we have stored and provided the true parents have been uh, genotyped and that we have their DNA somewhere, we can uh, uh, 
assign the correct parents based on the data we have stored. And so what that means is if we have this offspring, let's say, and we're searching through the database, we can see that in SNP1, this offspring is AA and the sire is BB. That means they can't possibly match because those are opposite homozygotes. And for that offspring to have come from that sire, it either would need to be BB or AB. Um, it can't, its sire uh, can't be an opposite homozygote. And so that is true for all of these SNPs. So in this case, the offspring is, is BB for SNP2 and sire1 is AA, so it can't possibly have uh, come from him. And so we're able to discount him as a potential sire, whereas sire2, uh, because sire2 is heterozygous for SNP1, that's not a useful piece of information we can use for parentage in this case, but for SNP2 and SNP3, sire2 is BB at the lo those locations and the offspring is also BB, so therefore we can consider him as being a potential match. And I say potential because parentage, uh, DNA-based parentage works on the principle of exclusion, which means that if, if we have two samples and they are like sire one and this offspring uh, definitively coming out as being conflicting, they are not a match, we can exclude them as being a parent offspring. But in the opposite situation where we are getting a match between a sire and an offspring, we can't conclusively say that that means that animal is the parent of this offspring. We can simply say that they are a potential match, but we don't know for certain what the relationship is. It could be sire offspring or it could be flipped around the other way. There's no way for us to tell which is the sire and which is the offspring uh, as an example. And for these kinds of activities, a lot of organizations typically utilize a, a small subset of SNPs, typically only one or two hundred SNPs, for example, and, and there are a few reasons for that, but one of the reasons, uh, as I understand it, is a technical reason around the storage of this data and the storage of these disparate chips and just having, when you have these disparate chips, if you just use a particular subset of say 200 SNPs, you can always extract those 200 SNPs out of your disparate data into uh, a singular SQL table, which makes it much easier for you to run these kinds of analyses. The problem with that is uh, it, it reduces the uh, uh, probability of exclusion between what would otherwise be uh, non-matching animals and that's not so bad when you're trying to verify parents, but when you're trying to do uh, this parent discovery process, if you have, say, one offspring and you want to see for that offspring out of these 50,000 uh, potential male genotypes that could be sires, which one of those is the match, uh, the difference between a 0.1% error rate and a 0.01% error rate could be the difference between, say, 100 sires being assigned or 10 sires being assigned. Uh, so uh, it's being able to use more of those SNPs allows us to get a much more definitive and accurate result about uh, the, the parentage between any two individuals. And because we are able to store and quickly query out these disparate pieces of genotype information in, in Badger, uh, we're able to resolve uh, a lot more of the information than we otherwise would. So, so, so just returning to sort of where this is important uh, and, and those are the kinds of queries we're doing with Badger and the way we're pulling the data out of it and really when it comes, comes down to it we're, we're trying to solve problems for our clients and, and in this case the highest management workload for them is typically resolving issues between DNA samples and the animals they belong to. And so being able to automate as much of that uh, process is, is very useful for uh, uh, reducing their costs. And those kinds of issues typically come down to either mislabeling of samples or poor quality or contaminated tissue. Uh, it could come down to a gender mismatch. Um, and that could mean that the individual that we have recorded for that animal is uh, 
let's say, recorded as a female in the database, but then the DNA samples we receive all appear to be from a male. And as it turns out that the animal itself is actually male and it's the animal database that is incorrectly recording it as female. And so these these processes help uh, with, with rectifying this uh, difference in information between these different systems. So it's all about automating that. And, and obviously I, there, there is a uh, potential extension of some of those concepts to add dgraph in as another layer, uh, which we are exploring to uh, especially resolve dgraph based, uh, uh, sorry, sample based metadata from, from lab information. So finally, uh, you know, plant and animal evaluation is the area we work in, and I just want to highlight that you know this this is a, a big industry. So for the New Zealand dairy herd, genetic improvement is estimated to be worth three hundred million dollars a year. And just to give you some context, the U.S. dairy industry genotyped one million animals in the last twelve months, and that costs roughly thirty dollars for each animal. So that means they're spending thirty million dollars in lab costs alone. Uh, not accounting for the storage and management of that data, which is where uh, this kind of tool comes in. So in conclusion, the, the increasing variety of genomic technologies and data require increasingly flexible tools for managing and analyzing that data, and gaining insights from that data is key to adding business value. Uh, but many of these uh, raw data structures are not well suited to SQL and those associated ecosystems, so we're looking to address that issue. And we found that BadgerDB is a powerful data store for, for custom applications like this. And uh, we provide a, a flexible genotype management platform for uh, uh, managing this kind of data. Thank you.